But uh, tonight we'll be looking at uh, the reason of the hope. Hope is always good, right? Hope is good to have, uh, and it's good to have reasons for it. Uh, but before we dive into that uh, study, I want to ask a few questions or look at a few truths about comfort. Uh, it is a true statement that we look for comfort. When you're buying something, when you're buying clothing, when you're buying shoes, is comfort a part of that process? Right? Now they have those shoes with the foam gel in it and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's lots of companies that made, have made a lot of money selling comfort. You know, we buy things for comfort. We want things that are comfortable. Uh, we may think it's great, but it must be comfortable, right? So we are, uh, by nature, because of that, creatures of comfort, uh, creatures of habit that seek after comfort. So our habits move us towards comfort. When it's comfortable, we make those habits that kind of form and we kind of follow those things. How many of you have just kind of woken up halfway through the day and realized, oh, I'm just kind of doing the same rote thing I do all the time, right? We, we do that, right? We get into those routines, we get into those things, those habits. Sometimes those habits can be great. Sometimes those habits can be not so great, right? But we, because of comfort, fall into those, into those things. Did you know that we are willing to do something uh, outside our comfort zone if it's worth it, right? You might work a little harder if you know there's a reward at the end. I might step outside of my comfort zone if there's a reward. Perhaps some cookies or something like that that we also need for VBS, just you know, throwing that in here. Uh, so those are some things that we might do, step outside of our comfort zone if we know the reward is worth it. Uh, I, I do remember the first time in my youth that I spoke to a girl. I thought it was going to be worth it. It wasn't Kara, so it wasn't worth it, right? So uh, anyway, but uh, you guys can decide that later on. But there are, there are things that we were willing to do, but sometimes maybe the reward isn't there. And the last thing is it's difficult to motivate something or somebody into action if they're comfortable. Right? Have you tried to get a child out of bed for school? Uh, they're hard to get out of, school, out of bed, right? They're comfortable. It's hard to get them out of bed. Uh, maybe it results to throwing water on them or something, get them to rise to action. Uh, I'm not saying we've done that. I'm just saying it's possible that, you know, that might work. Uh, but we've all been there where we're comfortable and it's hard to, to make those changes. Uh, and so we're going to look at that in comparison to what we're looking at uh, with our study. When we look at our, our passage that was read to us uh, from Peter, um, and First Peter, we, we see something that isn't common. Right? This concept, especially uh, in opposition to comfort, this idea of suffering. Um, beginning of verse 14, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. That is not something that we think is great, to, to be blessed in suffrage. We don't, we don't think about um, being blessed in, in suffering. Um, but... Peter began this letter with this concept of suffering. He said, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So he's writing to a congregation of people, a group of people who are already suffering, and he's saying, you're blessed to be suffering right now. Paul, that's not the, that's not the message I want. Right? I, want, I want a message that tells me that I don't have to suffer, that I can be comfortable, that I can, I can do things and be comfortable. I don't, I don't want to suffer. But that's not the message we have here. Uh, in, in chapter 2, he gives Jesus uh, as, as an example. We're going to look at this passage here uh, in chapter 2, second, or 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Um, he talks about this fact that, you know, we find the favor with God when we suffer for uh, for something unjustly. When we suffer unjustly, we are in favor from God when that happens. But he says, for what credit is there if you, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? So when we do something wrong and we suffer, that's not good, right? There's two kinds of suffering here. There's suffering for righteousness sake, there's suffering for injustice, uh, but not the concept of suffering for when we've done something wrong, that is something that we should learn from, not to do that again. That's for our learning. Uh, but when you do what is right and suffer for it, patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose. 
wait a second. I remember repent. I remember confess. I remember, remember being baptized for remission of sins. I remember living faithfully, but I do not remember being called for the purpose of suffering. That I don't remember. Nobody mentioned that when I signed on the dotted line. Well, Jesus did say, right, that we're not going to be greater than the master. If the master suffered, so are we going to be suffer for, suffering for his sake. Um, we even called for this purpose. So Christ also suffered for whom? Who did Christ suffer for? Us, right? Christ suffered for us. Should we be any different? Would we, would we do something that our Lord, or not do something that the Lord has done for us? leaving us an example for you to follow in his steps. Not just like, I'll, I'll kind of look like Jesus. I might wear the band, what would Jesus do? But I might not exactly do what Jesus does. No, he says, follow exactly in his footsteps as an example. And as you read, continue reading this, uh, talking about what he did on the cross for us, not offering... Um, and uttering a defense to him for himself, but entrusting himself to whom him who judges righteously. Does that help? If I know that God who judges righteously is watching what's happening, does that help us? Isn't that what Stephen did in Acts chapter seven and eight when he preached and was was stoned for for that message? Even he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As, as uh, uh, he looked up and saw God. But we need to make sure that we understand that we, we'll probably be suffering. That's part of uh, the job. And we'll talk more about that uh, later on. But this lesson isn't just about suffering, but it is something that is normal for a, for a Christian to be in this world uh, and, and suffer. In, in this passage in 1 Peter 4, he says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Now, there's a lot of times where, you know, something, somebody does something wrong and maybe we're surprised that I, how, how dare they do this to me, right? But should we be surprised that if we're trying to live a life that Christ has asked us to live in this world that is not trying to live that way, should we be surprised that it might be uncomfortable from time to time? Should we be surprised? Uh, this world that we're living in, and, and you know, maybe, maybe you feel like it's, it's getting worse than it's ever been. If you go back and look at history. It's been worse. Just saying. Uh, it's been worse. But it feels like for us as a generation, it's worse than what we remember. right? It, it's worse than what we remember. We're having to talk about things uh, that we never would have thought we'd ever have to talk about. And we can say on the one side, it's getting so bad. But you know what light does when it's darkest? shines brighter. So we can say on one side, you know what, it's getting so bad, I don't know what I'm going to do. Does it change what we're supposed to do? Does it change our mission? It doesn't change the message. It doesn't change anything. It, it gives us more opportunity to shine, to be an example to people around us. Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to be, right? It's supposed to be. This isn't supposed to be comfortable here. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a place to go to. Right? If this was heaven, why would we want to go anywhere else? It's not supposed to be comfortable. It's going to be, um, as a, it'll be awkward from time to time, right? But it's not supposed to be comfortable. Uh, when Lot was living in the area he was living in, it vexed his righteous soul. It had an effect on him. But we'll find comfort in that. Uh, we'll find comfort in God. When Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, uh, he says, which is effect, uh, effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings. So if you're suffering the same thing, uh, which we also suffer, and our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Where do we receive our comfort? Can we receive our comfort from the Lord? Can we receive our comfort from one another? If we're banding together and we are marching shoulder to shoulder shining his light in the darkness. Can we march forward into that darkness with our head held high, held, heads held high together marching forward? Is there comfort in that? That I'm not, I'm not doing this alone. We come together in this place to worship our God, to shine in this area. 
that we do it together because we have hope. We know what lies before us, and it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what goes on around us. It's because God has promised so many things for us, and we will be partakers uh, in that blessing. There are many who had suffered and there are many passages that talk about those who went through these things, but they went through it a different way. In Acts chapter 5, uh, we see those apostles that uh, they have been teaching about Christ. They were told not to teach about Christ. They were brought for the council a second time, and they're still teaching about Christ. And they were, they were beaten and then thrown out of the council, and the council told them, don't ever teach about Christ ever again. And of course, they conformed to what the, you know, the statutes of the land, they uh, heeded everything that everybody was telling them, and they never spoke about Christ again because they conformed to what society was telling them to do. Not what the message says, right? That is not what the message says. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer for his name. That is not what we normally do when we, see, when we suffer for something. We don't go on our way rejoicing that I was worthy to have been suffered for Christ. Sometimes we might hide because it gets uncomfortable, right, when, when we have to stand up and, and live differently. And I'm not saying you're going out there and, well, we'll get to that in a moment. But in this context, they did not conform to the social message. They said, this is the truth. We're standing on this line and you're not moving us from this truth. And we must, must do that. We cannot move from the truth. If we do, we have nothing to offer anybody. We must hold on to the truth. We cannot compromise. We cannot conform to this world, but help transform it by the power of God. Amen. Romans chapter 8. He's talking about the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. But further down in this passage, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. What, what we're suffering now, whatever it is that we go through, a trial that we go through that's, that's uncomfortable in this life, will not even be a drop in the ocean of what we will have in the future. That is our hope. But we have to remember that in the moment. We have to hold on to that when we're going through these things. Um, because there's certainly somebody out there who's wanting us to forget these things. And there are many who have marched before us through that same message. Uh, you've, you're familiar with this uh, chapter, maybe possibly familiar with these verse, this verse. But talking about those who lived in faith, all these died in faith without receiving the physical promise in that moment. They didn't receive it in that moment, but having seen them, having welcomed them from a distance, from afar, confessed they were strangers and exiles on this earth. It was a great song we were able to sing in, before this, and that we are just passing through this life. We are, this isn't the end, and there are people who have lived a life of faith with God prior to us who thought the same thing and lived the same thing, but as we read these things, they were thinking of a country, a celestial one. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God from heaven says, they're mine. The world around us says, who are these people? They're awkward. They're socially not right. They don't step in tune with what everybody's saying they're supposed to be doing. They stand out in a crowd. They're different. But God says, they're mine. They're mine. God said, I'm not ashamed for you to be called my child when you're walking the way that you're supposed to be walking. We can still go through this life walking with God. But we need to be ready to give an answer. Right? We, at some point, we need to talk to somebody. We will be examples in, in our lives, but at some point, we have to be able to give an answer. Why can we be different? As we look at this concept of hope, Looking at what hope is, the word hope for some can mean uh, a wish or an expectation. And there are many who wish to go to heaven, right? Many who wish to go to heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 and 21, many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in our name do many good works? And he said, depart from me, for I never knew you. There are many who said they want to go to heaven or wish to go to heaven, but the expectation of heaven are for those who can walk in step with what God has called us to do. According to the New Testament, hope is not anything that you can see. Hope is something that we look forward to. 
Hope is not, um, for in hope we have uh, been saved as uh, I am clicking too quickly. There we go. Uh, back to Romans chapter 8. For in hope we've been saved, but this, uh, it is seen, what is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what they've already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Um, I got to sit with my grandfather who was passing away. He's been a gospel preacher for 50 years. And I got to sit with him and him talk about his concept of what heaven is going to be like, right? And he was saying, I, just, I hope I get to sit on the grass and put my feet in the water and be with God, right? That's what he hopes for. Right? We all hope for what we don't see. We, we have in our mind an image of what heaven's going to be, and it helps us get through this. But can we give an answer for that? Can we say why we believe in those things? Can we stand up and say, this is why. This is what God has promised. He promised us eternal life. He said, this is what I'm going to give you. That's why I can, I can answer people in this way. There's something that we need to explain. 1 Peter 3.15 says it requires that we explain this, that we have a defense, an apologia. That we have to be able to, to say this is what it is. And again, Christ is our example in that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So for the joy that was set before him, for the hope that he was looking forward to, we ourselves are doing the same thing. He's given us that example. So we continue in doing that, always being ready. And Paul gives Timothy this kind of example, some, some things to be keep in mind as we're being ready ourselves. He says, until I come, give attention to public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, not neglecting the spiritual gift. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them. Have you ever seen somebody that took on a hobby that they just, they're absorbed in a hobby? Like, that's all they talk about. And then when you see them the next time, like, they're talking about the new thing they learned in their hobby, and they become that one person that talks about one thing, that they're a one-theme individual, right? Have you seen that person? That's, that's a person who's absorbed in, in a thing, right? Now, can, could, do our friends and family, do people around us know that we're absorbed in what it means to be a Christian? Do they know that about us? Would they say, oh, I, I know they're a Christian. And I'm not saying being annoying with it, right? We'll talk about that in just a second. But we need to make sure that, we, that we're absorbed in these things, not just for us. Uh, in this text, he even says, so that your progress will be evident to all. People will look at you and know that there's something different about you. Not just all the denim you're wearing, but there's something else about you, right? There's different uh, about you. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching, preserving these things. For as you do this, who am I helping? Am I helping myself, according to this passage? Yes, I'm helping myself. But who else am I helping in this passage? For yourself and for those who hear you. Us shining as lights, us being what we're supposed to do, even being different, uh, at times being in situations where it's uncomfortable, it's for us, but it's for others as well. It's for others as well. So we make a defense, but with gentleness and reverence when we, in doing so. Uh, we don't need to be arrogant and combative because the world is full of those people, and that doesn't really work, right? How many times have you seen somebody, uh, maybe on a message thread or some social media con uh, construct, where you, see, you read through a thread and some, they're, they're going back and forth. Have you read that before? Like the arguments going back and forth on, online. And at some point, somebody always says, you know what, you're right. You know what, you're right. I was completely wrong. I see that now. This combative format of, of arguing back and forth has really changed my mind on this. Have you seen that happen even once? That doesn't happen, does it? We're not willing, once we've entrenched ourselves into an argument and we've built this fortress and we've dug our ditches, we're not changing, right? We're not moving from the argument that we've made, even though maybe in the back of our minds we might know we're wrong. We're not moving. Combative format doesn't work. Arrogance doesn't work. We can have confidence in a living hope that we should have, but we can have that with humility and respect. 
In Colossians chapter 4, Paul talks about this. He says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity of the time, of every opportunity we have, make the most of it, and talking to people about the hope that we have. Let your speech be always with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so you will know how you should respond to each person. You mean how I talk is important? The words that I use, I should choose wisely? What are you talking about? I can't use trigger words anymore? Maybe use them and talk in a way that's appropriate for the person you're talking to. There have been times where I've had to be extremely careful in picking my words and choosing them correctly. And then there are other times where there are people who don't hear anything but strong language and I had to be very strong with them because of the, the circumstances. But you have to be wise enough to know when to do that. And we have to be wise enough and that starts by getting the word inside of us. It starts by getting the word inside of us and getting that wisdom so that we can respond in a way that's appropriate. When we do this, we need to remember why we're doing this. It is not, we're not doing these things to be right. We're not doing these things just to be right. We're not doing these things to win arguments. We're not doing these things just so that we can, you know, sow consternation in the world around us. That is not why we're doing these things. We're doing these things because we care about people's souls. And in the end, that's what's most important. If I have to be uncomfortable, if I have to take a step back, if I need to do something in any way, I need to make sure I'm doing everything I can to, to help others go to heaven and not be a stumbling block. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Have mercy on some who are doubting. You've met a doubter. Am I supposed to just give them both barrels of truth and say, you should just believe this? Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by flesh. Do you know that what we're doing here on this earth, we're literally pouring, pulling people out of the fire on a daily basis. We have a message to help people pull get pulled out of the fire, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. The garment. The garment. Not the person. Do people make poor decisions? Have we made poor decisions that somebody has had to correct us on? Yes. The world is full of people who have made poor decisions. We do not hate them, we do not despise them, we love them with everything we can because of God has shown love to them. We hate the sin and we do everything we can to pull that person out of the fire. We speak humbly with mercy and love, showing that to them. Isn't that what we would want? That's what we would want. With gentleness and reverence, we have to do that. If we're going to make a change in people's lives, we must change the way we talk. We must make sure our speech is in a way that's appropriate for those who listen. So we've looked at this passage. We've talked about those who are blessed, even when we suffer. We've talked about being ready. We've talked about gentleness and reverence. I want to go back to some of these questions we talked about, about comfort. Where do we look for comfort? Are we looking for comfort in this world? Or are we looking for comfort that will come, looking for comfort that we have from one another in the church? Or are we looking for comfort in this world? We need to ask ourselves that question. Where am I most comfortable? Am I most comfortable amongst my brothers and sisters in Christ? Or am I most comfortable in the world? You have to answer that question. You have to answer that question. When I look about my habits, are my habits helping helping me or our habits helping us or hindering us in our walk? Have I gotten too comfortable with my habits? Have I allowed them to pull me away in a direction that I never intended to be in and gotten too comfortable? Has God not promised us a reward worth enduring the suffering? God is saying, 
this is what I have promised you. I've promised you eternal life. I've promised you a life of, of no more, of former things, of eternal life. That's what I've promised you if you will hold on for a little while. If you'll hold on for a little while and help others hold on as well. It's worth it, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. For those who are visiting, it's worth it. But we got to hold on just in a little while. We see this world and we see it's, it's hard for us to think of a world of forever, of a place of forever, because we're so surrounded by these things that are temporal. But if we can step outside our comfort zone and examine these things for the truths that they are and make these decisions, we need to see that this is the reward. And lastly, will we be motivated to action or are we too comfortable? Are we comfortable where we are right now? I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. Almost. Almost persuaded. Tonight, you, meet, you might need to make a decision to follow Christ. You might need to come forward and say, I need to repent. I need to make some changes in my life. There are things that I have done publicly. I have sinned. I've been too comfortable. I've allowed habits to form my life that don't need to be. I've allowed people to influence me in a way that I don't need in my life, and I need to make some changes. And we're here to help, and we're here to rejoice, and we're here to do those things together. If you're here tonight, and maybe you need to put on Christ in baptism, you need to come forward and say, I need to make changes in my life. I need to repent. I need to confess his name before men. I need to put him on in baptism. I need to live faithful. I need the help of my brothers and sisters to do that. Tonight, that opportunity is for you. Do not let yourself get too comfortable. If tonight, when you stand up, you need to come forward, please do so as we stand and as we sing.